John chapter 4. Can you get there? Will you put up your Bible and repeat after me? This is my Bible. This is my Bible. My sword of the Spirit. My sword of the Spirit. It says I believe. It says I believe. It says I will do. It says I will do. I have the power of the Holy Spirit. I have the power of the Holy Spirit. Who lives within me? I told you a little bit before we came in. I said, now, don't worry, I've never lost anyone. I almost did today. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Let's look at verse 19. If you want to follow along, this is the one as well, the account, and I just want to read you part of it. Jesus went to uh, Samaria and he had this encounter with this Samaritan woman. This part of that discussion it says in verse 19 The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I ask you a question. I'm going to answer that loud. In your mind, answer this question. Why are you here today? Why did you come? Or why do you go to church in general? I know some people are visiting here today and they have a, a home church that may not be open today or something. Why do you go to worship? Why do you go gather together with other believers? Why do you come together and, uh, and worship? Let me give you some reasons that are uh, probably not very good reasons to come together to worship. The first is maybe you come to worship to just punch a ticket. You know, it's just, you, you feel like it's your obligation. You know, you're one hour a week, get together, you know. If I punch that, if I punch the ticket to get punched, then the rest of the week, you know, I'm fine, it's, it's okay. If, if you don't get that ticket punched, then, you know, for some reason God looks down upon you. And so, you know, you've got to make sure you do your duty as a Christian. Uh, maybe there's a physical game involved. Maybe you go because there's some kind of a physical game. Maybe you think that if I go, then God's blessings will be upon me and I'll gain something, you know, physically. Maybe you go just to be entertained. Maybe you go because, well, you know, that's the one your family attends, so you go there because of that. Or maybe uh, it's because of the great preacher. You know. <laughs> maybe the music is, is really good, so you go there because of that. You like the kind of music or the style of music. Uh, maybe you go because, uh, I don't know, maybe you're dating somebody who goes there. So that's why you go. What, maybe you like it for the great events. Maybe you like the upcoming Valentine's Day dinner. So, hey. Let's go there for that. Why do you come? Maybe, uh, you know, there are actually people who go to worship because they can get good business contacts. So, also, maybe you come to worship, whether here or any place else, because it's the church you grew up in. Well, not all of these are necessarily bad in and of themselves, but if that's your only sole reason, then maybe you're not actually participating in worship. So, we're going to look at this woman in this situation, and we're going to look at a different woman in a moment. So go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 7, and then you'll be there ahead of me. Luke chapter 7. Now Jesus said to the woman in chapter 4 of John, he said that there is coming an hour, and now is when the true worshipers will worship in what? What was the two words? In what? We'll worship in what? Spirit and what? Truth. And then, like uh, the next verse down, he mentions it again. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and truth. So the Samaritans, and the reason he said that is because the Samaritans were really good at worshiping God in with spirit. In other words, with a lot of emotion. They worshiped God, but they just went all out and they just laid all out there emotionally. They were just drained and exhausted because they worshiped God. Now, if you remember, Jesus told them, he said, you worship who you don't know. They lacked the truth. All they did was worship in spirit, in emotion. And they had no truth. And then the Jews, on the other hand, they worshiped with truth, in truth. They had God's word. They had the Old Testament canon 
And they had that together, and so they, they were just steeped in truth, which was a good thing, but there was no spirit. There was absolutely no emotion. And so Jesus said there's coming a time, and now is, that people will worship, true worshipers will worship together in spirit and in truth. So, in other words, there's a balance. Do you realize that the same is true today? Some churches, they worship just simply in the spirit. Just emotion. It's just emotion. It's just motion driven. Everything. To so the music, it's set up even to where the music is just, it's emotional driven. And, and uh, some, you know, some churches, and this is across the denominational lines. Uh, what, what do you think of when you think of an emotional situation? What, what particular denomination or denomination do you think of? It's across, it, it's not just Pentecostal. Not that all Pentecostals are emotional, that's not what I'm saying. But that's what we tend to think of. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Nothing wrong with it. But what I'm saying is, is it's across denominational lines now that people are emotional and driven in some churches. And so they, they have this attitude that it, God didn't show up unless people stormed the altar. God didn't show up unless certain things happened. If people just were bawling out. I've been in a church service before where uh, the, the, the pastor, the evangelist at the time, I mean, he was, he was literally, we, for a half an hour, I think his goal was to get everybody that was sitting out there to the altar. And, all right, just one more verse. Just one more verse of just as I am. I, did you ever know there was like 50 verses of just as I am? <laughs> I am not lying. I am not lying. Yeah. Pull, pull up verse 49. Let's say that. <laughs> And, and, and literally, you know, I, me and another guy was probably the only one sitting out there. And it was like, who's he talking to? Well, it's me or the other guy. <laughs> but there are churches that are strictly just emotionally driven. And they worship in spirit. And then there's churches that are, you know, well, let's go back to the emotionally driven. Uh, oh, Shane and I went to the church down in uh, Charlestown before we came here. Was youth pastor slash worship minister, and they were telling me a story that years and years before that, that uh, they were so you know everything was so emotionally driven and everything that they saw a demon around under every rock. There's a you know, but Satan caused this or Satan was behind this. There's a spirit of this. There's a spirit of this in certain people. And so this guy showed up one night at their church service, their midweek service, and he came in and he was he was obviously he had been drinking. It was very obvious. He comes stumbling into the church. I guess he was looking for help or something. And he walks in immediately because, again, they're emotionally driven like that. They, they, uh, and there was a demon around every corner. They, they started to lay hands on the guy and pray out this demon. I guess demon of alcohol or whatever. They're going to pray this demon out. So they all laid hands on him. They were trying to cast this demon out. And the guy was, you know, he was just kind of stumbling around. And the guy was telling me he was kind of chuckling. Him. And he said, and we laid our hands on him. And one of the guys said, demon, what is your name? And the guy looks at him and says, George. <laughs> Again, the idea that behind it is just it, it, there's not a demon behind every rock. Are demons real? Yes. Can they influence? Can they possess? Yes. But not everything, you see. But that's what happens when everything is emotionally driven. Then there's those who are just driven simply by the truth, which is a good thing. There's, the truth is, is, is awesome, but there's absolutely no emotion. There's no emotion. There's no laughter. There's no tears. There's no, 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 ex, no getting excited. You know, I had actually one person tell me one time, you know, Mark, you, you, you tell too many jokes. I'm like, really? I like it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the constructive criticism, I guess. But I guess, you know, it's just strictly the truth. I'm sorry, but I think God has a sense of humor. Look at it. <laughs> Seriously. Look at your neighbor. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. Don't laugh. Okay. But seriously, they're steeped in the truth so much that, that uh, you know, you don't hear any kids' voices. The truth. See, there should be a balance of spirit and truth. See, what happens when you're driven just spiritually only, emotionally only, then what happens is that the emotional part becomes the idol that you worship. It becomes the idol that if, if you don't have certain feeling when you worship, then God didn't show up. 
if I went by my feelings every Sunday and I, and I didn't feel like God, you know, I didn't feel this tingling or I didn't feel this or that, and guess what? I would think that a lot of Sundays God didn't show up. But I know He's here. And so if you're spiritually just driven, then, again, like I said, the, the emotion becomes the idol that is worshipped. And if you're just truth only, then what happens is you become judgmental. That's what happens. When there is no nothing else, there's no love, there's just truth, then what happens is you begin to, to pound home everything that they're doing wrong. Those who are in the spirit are just worshiping the spirit. See, there's got to be a balance, write this down, between your head and your heart. There's got to be a balance between there. And that's what Jesus is talking about. There's going to time, and now is today, that people, true worshipers, true worshipers, his words not mine, will worship in spirit and truth. Balance. Little Bobby. Went to Sunday school and he learned that Eve came from Adam's rib. He was intrigued by that. He was just very enthralled with how Eve came from his rib. And so he, a couple weeks went by and his mother found a little Bobby laying on the floor. He was holding his side. He was just in a lot of pain. She could tell. And he was like, Bobby, what's going on? He said, I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's important what you do with that truth. <laughs> you can have all the truth in the world. Paul said it this way. If I speak with tongues that have not love, I'm like, like, like sounding symbols and playing symbols. I, I'm nothing. If you have all the truth in the world and you have not love, you have not, you know, anything else, then you're just, you know... See, worship... Simply comes from a word means worship. Worth. It has to do with worth. We worship God because He's worthy of our worship and praise. We worship Him because of who He is. We worship Him because He is the Creator. We worship Him because He deserves our praise and our worship. We worship Him because of that. And He, if anybody, is worthy of it. It's Him. And worship is a hard thing, but it also it is expressed outwardly, or can be expressed. You know, I was thinking about this message as I was preparing it this week, and uh, I do this. I have in my mind a certain way that people ought to worship. And if they're not worshiping in this certain mindset that I have, then I think, why well, they must not be worshiping? Until I realize that, you know, you don't have to worship according to my definition of worship. You don't have to do that. Because worship can be expressed in whatever way you feel. But let me give you seven words for praise. We've given these before, but just to just to give you an example of how outwardly it can be expressed. And these are just seven. But if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. The, the first word for praise in the Old Testament Hebrew is Shabbat. It means to shout. See? It's expressed by the spirit. Emotion. Shout. It can be. And then there's Todah, which means confession or praise. And then there's samar, another word for praise. It means to make music or to sing or to play an instrument. So uh, what we do here, what magicians, magicians, the musicians are doing is they're praising. They are they are samaring God. They are word praising God with their instruments. And then there's tequila, not tequila, tequila, <laughs> which means a song or a hymn. Then there's barak or barak. It means to bless or to kneel. So there's a way that you can express worship is to kneel. And then there's yada, which means to give thanks with extended hands, which means to raise. That's why, you know, we talk about, uh, the New Testament talks about raising, lifting up holy hands. And, and then the Old Testament it talks about praise being yada. You're extending your hands in thanks and praise. And I've had people tell me before, you know, gosh, Mark, I've really, you know, I want to raise my hands, but I don't see a lot of people doing that here. Is that, you know, is that illegal? I don't say that, but is it, is it all right? Well, sure, it's all right. It's biblical to do that. And then I've heard some people say, you know, I, I, I feel like raising my hands sometimes, but I think people are going to think I'm nuts. They probably will. But it's biblical. 
what you're doing is, is you're expressing outwardly an inward uh, praise. And then there's my favorite, Hallel. Everybody say it with me. Hallel. Say it again. Hallel. H-A-L-L-A-L. It means to shine. It means to rave or boast. Here's my favorite part of the definition. To act clamorously foolish. Let me say that again. To act clamorously foolish. Now, let me just say this. God is a God of order. God is a God of order. I've heard of some revivals where uh, there are people that are making animal noises. And it's chaos. Now, I don't want to make a judgment on that, but God is a God of order. Not chaos. But I, I do want to say this, that I believe there are times when we need to act clamorously foolish and impressive. What did David do when he got along? What did he do? What did he do? He danced before the Lord. I don't see anybody dancing in here, but I think at times that would be all right. He was expressing himself and acting, I believe, when in Hallel, in acting clamorously foolish. And you know what? He looked crazy to the one that saw him dancing. Now, again, you don't have to. Those are just some ways in which you can praise God. You can express that phrase. You can express that worship. But some say that you must, that you must do those things. That you must, uh, whatever, we were talking about one group that said if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. You know, you must do these things. Or you're not worshiping if you don't raise your hand. Well, like I said a while ago, you worship God in the freedom that He's given you to worship. Amen? You worship Him the way that you want to express that. Listen, don't be afraid to shout. Don't be afraid to boast. Don't be afraid to act clamorously foolish and lift your hands and kneel. You may have a moment where during, during our worship time, whatever, during communion, whatever. During communion time, if you wanted to come up here and kneel at the altar and just pray, feel free to do that. No, again, God is a God of order. I don't think that you need to, you know, disrupt everybody by doing that, you know, and coming up and saying, look at me, I'm going to do the altar. You understand what I'm saying? But feel free to express yourself to God in spirit and in truth. Listen, we have this wrong idea of God. We think that, that the worship team is up here, and sometimes we think, okay, they're performing for us today. All right? Maybe he does a great job on the piano. She's doing a great job, you know, and, and uh, everybody else is just out playing. They're doing a great job. And, and sometimes we get this tendency of, uh, let's just sit back and listen and watch the show. And the problem with that is, is, is a skewed view of what worship is. See, God is the audience. And we are the performer. All of you and us, all we are doing is leading you in performing or to worshiping and expressing in worship to God. In all reality, if we could take the band down here, turn us this way, God would be here watching the show, if you will. And taking in the worship, taking in the praise, taking in the glory and the honor. So change, let's change our mindset of that. Turn now, look at Luke chapter 7. Look at verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant and oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had 
invited him, saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. Now many scholars believe that she was a sinner means that she was very possibly a prostitute. And most interpret that to mean that because it's the way it's written out here. Verse 40, And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom, I, whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since, she, since the time she came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go on. First of all, I want you to see the difference of attitudes here. One is the, the difference of Simon and his attitude. One was he was a passive. When he came into the presence of God, he came into the presence of Christ, he was very passive. Jesus said, you didn't give me a kiss, which you normally would have greeted each other with a holy kiss. You didn't greet, greet me like you would a normal guest in your home. You didn't greet me with a kiss. There was no oil for my head, which they would anoint your head with oil, because on traveling and stuff, when you got there, you'd stink. And so they put a little fragrant oil on your head and, and perfume you up and clean you up a little bit. It would be like cleaning up. And then he said, you didn't even wash my feet, which was common to do for a guest. to wash their dirty feet from their traps. He said, you didn't even do that. Then the attitude that he had was being judgmental. What did he say? If he only knew who was touching his feet, if he was a prophet, this prostitute, this sinner, and then the assumption, if he only knew, he, he, he assumed that he assumed wrong that he didn't know, but he knew. That. Then the attitudes of others around the table. Who is this guy who forgives sin? Who is this guy? Let me ask you, when you come together to worship, where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as Simon? Do you see yourself as the others around the table? Or do you see yourself as this woman? Let's look at her attitude very quickly. She says she came in, and from the time she came in, she was crying. Can you just see the picture of this woman, most of her life maybe, selling her body? Selling herself. She hears Jesus is in this house. And so she comes broken broken and she comes in and she just in the presence she just is is weeping and everybody around her is just judging it well we know her look at her who's she that whore she's coming in at his feet if he only knew what I even saw her who I saw her with but she was in his presence and she realized she was in the presence of God she was in the presence of the Savior, and she knew she was in his presence. I love the story of the little Johnny. He's sick one Sunday, and the parents leave him at home with his babysitter. Happened to be Palm Sunday, and they come home, the family comes home with these palm branches. And little Johnny's like, what's the palm branches? And Dad says, well, they, everybody held these over the heads of Jesus when he came by. Little Johnny says, dang it. Well, you know what? The one Sunday I miss when he shows up. <laughs> when, when you come to worship, when you gather, and not just here, because don't get the idea that you can only worship here, but when you're in his presence and you're worshiping God, do you, do you sense his presence? Do you know he's there? Whether you feel anything or not, doesn't matter. He's there. Another thing was that she knew she was sinful. 
one of the things that worship does is it puts us in a humbling role to, to, to remember. I mean, that's what happens when we take, take a communion is we are reminded that we're what? Simon forgot that, didn't he? I'm a Pharisee. I'm the same spiritual guru. I'm just this leader. I'm, I'm good. I'm much better than her. See, he forgot that at the foot of the cross, he stood co-equal to this woman, right? He may not have prostituted himself, but he was just as much of a spiritual whore as she was. I'm just speaking truth, right? He just as just as much, and and he forgot that. And so when we worship, we begin to be reminded humbly that I'm standing in the presence of a holy God, worshiping Him and pouring myself out. If the band will come. Feel free to sit there if you want. Because you know what? 